Asia on the rise. It's become a frequent topic of conversation in various parts of the world. For starters, there is Asia's sheer size. The continent accounts for one third of the world's total land mass and two thirds of its total population. And as economic dynamism pivots eastward, the Asian market is now unleashing its potential. But what does that mean for the future of the world? Earlier, I was joined by a guest who argues that the future of the world is Asia. Parag Khanna is the founder and managing partner of Future Map, a data and scenario based consultancy. He's also the author of six books, including his latest entitled The Future is Asian. In this book, Parag writes that while the world was Europeanized in the 19th century, then Americanized in the 20th century, it's now being Asianized in the 21st century. I started by asking him what exactly does he mean by Asianized? It's so interesting, there's two dimensions to it. The first is that Asia is Asianizing. And if Asia is Asianizing, that actually means most of the world already because more than 50% of the world population, almost 5 billion people, live in Asia. And that is, in fact, the story of the past 30 years. In the past 30 years, since the collapse of the Soviet Union, Asian countries all the way from Japan and China and Northeast Asia to Southeast Asia to India and even West Asia, like the Gulf countries, mm -hmm. Arab uh, countries, have been integrating over the past 30 years. And then there's the Asianization of the rest of the world. And you can see the growing influence of China, of India, Japan, in Europe, in North America, in South America, in Africa. So what I try to do is to explain two things the internal integration and growing coherence of Asia and the collective impact of Asia in the whole world. Asia will probably continue to be Asianized. It will continue to be Asia. But what makes you so sure that the rest of the world will, will be Asianized? I mean, Asian influences or presence are growing in Europe, let's say, more Chinese business people. But what kind of trend are we seeing further down the road? Well, actually, these are not just small anecdotes. These are very big numbers. China is the largest trading partner of more countries in the world than any other. And that includes every South American country on the other side of the planet, right? It's a huge trading partner of Europe. In the midst of the geopolitical tensions that we're facing right now between the United States and China, a lot of people forget that Europe trades much more with China than America does. And I've lived in Europe a lot over the last 30 years, and especially in Germany, and I see more and more Chinese and Indians. And you know that Europeans have a labor shortage. So they're importing lots of Chinese students and engineers and Indian software programmers. I've never seen this volume of Asians in Europe. In what sense will the future be, be Asian? The population spreading further mm -hmm. around the world or Asia's percentage of its GDP growth uh, growing in the overall world economy or Asian countries playing a more dominant role in global governance mm -hmm. or something else? All of those things and, and a lot more. In a way, I could have called the book The Present is Asian because... Already? Of course, more than half the world population is in Asia. Uh, as of next year, effectively already, 50% of the global economy is in Asia in purchasing power parity terms, which is the correct way to measure economic size uh, of, of specific markets. So yes, the present is already quite Asian. We're also seeing, of course, with the Belt and Road Initiative and associated organizations, that there is leadership in global governance coming from Asia. The idea of infrastructure as a global public good that Asians are concentrating and now sharing and spreading around the world is an idea that's emerging from Asia in a way because it's something, infrastructure, that has been neglected actually by Western institutions. So that's an example of Asian diplomatic leadership as well. What about Asian culture or what about Asians, let's say, that, that make you so sure that this is going to be the case? Basically, why? is the future going, uh, going to be Asia simply because of our size, simply because we are more you know, numerous in numbers? I actually think that one of the mistakes that we have been making in looking at Asia, whether as uh, English language discourse or Asians themselves, is that we still look at our own region, we look at this region 
as individual countries that are very discrete from each other. We talk about what's happening in China. We talk about what's happening in India, what's happening in Japan, what's happening in Southeast Asia. Here's what we fail to appreciate. It is actually a collective story. When Japan rose in the 1960s and 70s and became the world's second largest economy, it inspired the tiger economies, South Korea, Hong Kong, Singapore, Taiwan, right? Then it was those countries, the first wave and the second wave of Asian growth, that were the leading investors in China when China opened in 1979, 40 years ago. So the first wave and the second wave of Asian growth helped the Chinese wave, and now we have a fourth wave of India, Pakistan, Southeast Asian countries. And who are the leading investors in those countries? China. It's China and Japan and Singapore, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So these four waves have been reinforcing each other. People need to appreciate, in Asia, we ourselves have to appreciate, there is actually a collective Asia story. It's not just Japan then, China today, maybe India tomorrow. No, it's actually a full mutually reinforcing story. What about this Asian system that you're talking about that will guarantee that it continues to reinvent itself, that even bringing uh, further greater areas or peoples in the world to be Asianized? Mm -hmm. It's absolutely remarkable how from the breadth of Asia, again from Japan to Saudi Arabia, from Russia to Australia, this Asian system already has more trade internally than with the whole rest of the world. So the Asian system exists, right? And it's already more significant for China and for India and Japan, for all of its members than the rest of the world. I have to remind everyone that for China, China's largest trading partner is its Asian neighbors. And number two is Europe, and number three is America. So there is a lot more to go, because within this Asian system, we have oil producers and food producers and industrial centers, technology centers, financial centers. We have countries with old populations and young populations. All of that is resources to be shared. Right? Economics is about the optimization of land, labor, and capital. Yeah. And we are just a couple of decades into this process that might last for many decades of Asians learning to uh, exploit those complementarities that they have with each other. So that gives me confidence that the Asian system will progress because there's so many ways in which Asians can actually help each other and want to help each other because it's mutually profitable to help each other. But this is not possible among other peoples in the world, in, in Americas, it in is. the Americas. But why is, is, are they not able to shape the future in, in a significant way that, that Asia could? Well, so actually I believe that for the first time in history, we live in a truly multipolar world. North America is still a superpower region. I still believe the European Union is a regulatory and a trade and economic economic and diplomatic superpower. And now Asia is joining that system. And within Asia, you have Japan, China, India, you have numerous powers. I think China is the most powerful, but Asia is such a big system in and of itself that it's not just one power. As I said, Asia is almost 5 billion people, and China is only 1.5 billion of those people. Asia is a huge economic area, and China is a huge economy, but China is only half of the total Asian economy. So there is a huge Asian story, but I do not ignore the West in both parts of the West, North America and Europe. I really believe that it will be a multipolar world. However, what's new based versus the 20th century is that you also have this rising Asian influence. It's not just a world shaped by um, European values or American values, but rather we have to appreciate a new set of Asian influences as well. It's a new layer that's being added. Mm -hmm. And that's the way history works. It's not that one empire disposes of the past. You actually absorb and modify and adapt the lessons of the past, but you also add your own new innovations as well. And I think that would be a good summary of what China and India and others are doing today. You're talking about uh, values. What about the Asian values that, has, that have enabled this wave after wave of economic growth and basically emancipation of our brain power? Right. I talk about three things in this book. There was a usage of this term Asian values in the 1990s, of course, but we don't use it in that way anymore. 
because that was before the Asian financial crisis and that have a, had a very negative impact on the confidence of Asia. But in the past 20 years, of course, Asians have recovered tremendously from that experience. So today in the 21st century, I talk about the three new Asian values. One of them is what I call technocratic governance, right? There is a preference, you know, for having a strong leader, a strong executive leadership mm -hmm. that has a long-term vision that is focused on a national and collective modernization and welfare and uplifting the poor and so forth. And then there's the role, the second is mixed capitalism, right? You know, all Asians accept, even if they're in capitalist societies and in open and liberal political economies, there's still a role for the state in the economy in uplifting the poor, in supporting certain industries, in stimulating innovation. We all agree about that in Asia. Mm -hmm. And the third is what I call a social uh, conservatism, which is to say that, you know, Asian societies, uh, no matter what their religion, no matter what the regime, uh, you know, no matter what the culture, we're actually quite cautious about social liberalization in a wide range of areas. And I use many examples in the book from the death penalty to internet freedom and, you know, caution about allowing uh, unlimited sort of, you know, free speech on the internet because that can be damaging to social stability. And that's an example of being cautious. So this sort of social caution, technocratic governance and mixed capitalism to me are the three new Asian values. And I see them in different ways, of course. It, it looks differently in Australia than in Kazakhstan mm. or in Iran versus China, of course, or in India versus Japan. But I see these elements present in most Asian societies. Do you think these values are being heeded or even um, studied or paid enough attention to from, by people from other cultures who are probably wondering the rapid rise of Asia and how, has, how it has come about? I think that it's because of this amazement about Asia's rapid rise that people all over the world are starting to pay attention. We can clearly see the number of students and policymakers who come to China, for example, in the same way that they used to and maybe still do also go to Japan. Most certainly in Singapore, where I live, we see thousands and thousands of officials and, and ministers and governors and students coming to learn about public policy and how to set up a strong civil service that uses scenarios and data to make policy, how to do urban planning. In these areas of you know, fundamental, functional policy making, how to improve your society, there's a lot that Asians can learn from each other and clearly there's a lot that Africans and Latin Americans and Arabs can learn from the success of East Asia. So yes, we see that conversation and that's part of the Asian system is what I call socialization. Asians socializing with each other. China has never had so many foreign students studying in China. No. You can see the same thing in Seoul and South Korea mm -hmm. and in Tokyo as well and in Singapore. And more and more you find that we are offering these programs in the English language, you know, a common denominator, and that's allowing more and more socialization to take place. And that's a very important layer yeah. of this comfort level that Asians have with each other. Finally, what makes the rise of Asia different from the rise of uh, the, the other regions in the previous centuries or decades? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, Asia's system is much larger. It's much more diverse. This is the most diverse region of the world. There are six or seven major civilizations in Asia, whereas in Euro Europe is a more or less homogenous civilization. There are numerous European powers that went forth and conquered the world and established colonies in Asia, and that's what made Europe the superpower region, if you will, but through competition. In Asia, too, what's similar, perhaps, is that, of course, Asian powers do compete with each other. There's a lot of tensions, a lot of flashpoints between Asian countries. But we've been managing to keep those tensions at bay. We've been focusing on our economic complementarities. And all Asian countries are expanding outward to protect their influence, sometimes in competition, sometimes in collaboration with each other. So there are similarities to the rise of Europe, for sure. Mm. But the differences are also you know, even more significant because of how diverse and, and, and how broad the geography is. And very importantly, when it comes to how we manage conflicts, remember that in European history, especially in the 20th century, a small local war became a big regional war. Right. And my hope is that for in the Asian context, we can limit our conflicts and isolate them and keep them as small as possible so that it does not disrupt the evolution of this broader Asian system.
fascinating conversation and all the best for the future of this book, The Future is Asian. Thank you so much, Para Kana. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. My interview with Parag Khanna, founder and managing partner of Future Map. And with that, we come to the end of this edition of The Point with me, Lu Xin. As always, you can follow me on Facebook and Twitter using the handle The Point with LX. Download the application called CGTN to watch the show on your mobile devices or go to YouTube and look for CGTN The Point. Thanks for watching. You've got The Point.